going three, two. And we're live. Welcome to the Ultimate Gravity Show. We're at Five Paddles Brewing, we're actually, and we're gonna do the yeah, intro again. No, no, intro. we're not. We're actually not live, but we're well, we're live, but they're not. When you're listening to this right now, well, they're alive too. But I'm gonna get down a rabbit hole here. Yeah, you're, you're confusing yourself now. I am confusing myself. We're at Five Paddles Brewing Company. Uh, I'm host Jason McGray, and you um, are Scott Dewsbury. Is that audio okay? The audio is good. It's All right. really loud. Yeah. We could turn it down if we want, but I don't usually do that when we're live. But there we go. Right. Yeah. And our guest today. Oh, is yeah. Ian from Five Paddles. Yeah. You're one of the four owners. I am, yeah. One yeah. of the four owners. That's right, yeah. And the other ones are Spencer, Pierre, and... Uh, Spencer, Ed, and Mike. Ed. Yeah. Where'd you get Pierre? Because I got an I got an email and it said Pierre from Five Paddles. Yeah, Pierre's our front room guy. He's oh, uh, he's really the the pillar that keeps us uh, open. He's he's I been the face of Five Paddles for for quite a few years now, and he's uh, uh, kind of developed uh, uh, our front room into what it is now. It's been pretty amazing. He's, a, he's an incredible guy, and he knows his beer. Uh, he's a big hothead. He loves his uh, spicy food too. So he's introduced a lot of spicy food. Did he do all the, the furniture and all this stuff? Uh, no, the this was all Mike. Uh, Mike, he he came in with the idea of uh, doing our front room, and uh, you know he kind of floated a couple of crazy ideas past me, and I was like, listen, man, don't don't ask me for any advice on this because uh, I'm going to say no to all of it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I said, just run with it as long as the budget is low, and uh, you know I'm cheap. And uh, he said, don't worry, I can do it for, for hardly anything. And, uh, yeah, he pulled this all together. So this is all really? Mike's brainchild. It's, it's There's a lot of wood in here. I would yeah. think wood would be cheap. Yeah, it's mostly skid wood. Uh, yeah. Skid we, wood's, we, like, very new trend. Like, absolutely. a lot of people love to build <laughs> skid wood. <laughs> yeah. It's very man rustic in here. It is. it is. It's excellent. Yeah. yeah. It I makes like me it. feel at home. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. He <laughs> had this idea for the uh, the cigar wall uh, yeah. using the cigar boxes. I, I, none of us smoke cigars. Um, I so. I think it's enough cigars to kill a couple of people. So are all the cigars from the boxes in the back somewhere? Uh, no, they. Uh, oh. we were lucky enough to go to Victory Cigar in Oshawa. And, oh, uh, Victory, he had, yeah. yeah uh, great guys there, and uh, they were able to hook us up with a lot of boxes. So over right. the course of a couple of months, uh, we slowly picked up as many as we could. So, right on, yeah. Uh, it's kind of cool that, uh, to do something like that as an accent it's wall. It's almost disappointing because I was hoping that you'd have a stash of cigars I could pick from. I, uh, from, <laughs> from, what I've heard about, yeah, from what I've heard about these boxes, there there would be a stash of about 50 grand worth of oh. uh, yeah. Easy cigars, yeah, Easy. yeah for yeah. sure. <laughs> so, uh, so we Ed, yeah, it was Ed Spencer, and you Mike, yeah. and Mike, yeah. right? Okay. So, um, we uh, tell us about the, the for everybody wants to know the history of Five Paddles, mm-hmm. how you guys got together. Yep. Where the name come from? Where the idea come from? To start up a brewery of all things. Yeah, yeah. Just to hammer you with all the questions at once. Well, that's yeah. okay. <laughs> come out of the gates flying. It's the best way to do. It. So. Uh, we all met at the local homebrew club. Uh, we had all been homebrewing prior to, to joining the club. Um, this was probably, I want to say, about seven years ago that we first met. Uh, Ed and Mike went to the very first Durham Homebrewers Club meeting. Uh, we've, we've told a, a number of people about Durham Homebrewers Club, and it, it, it really was our church. You know, like I, They went to the first one. Uh, Mike actually went to the first one and came out of it and said to his wife, he's like, I don't know if I'm going to go back. It was really intense, right? Like mm. When you get together with a bunch of homebrewers, it's, uh, it's a lot of drinking. Um, you know, you spend eight hours drinking and sampling, and there's a lot of crazy people that, that go to these meetings. Uh, so he didn't know if he was going to go back, but he did. And uh, I met him and Ed on the third meeting, and there was only about maybe six of us that were there. Uh, Spencer wasn't living in the area at the time. He he moved here about a year after Durham Homebrewers uh, started. Uh, Chris Bordage uh, started it uh, seven years ago, and he's grown to over... I, believe it's over 500 members now uh so it started off really as a facebook group but he he was a driving force behind it chris is, has really developed uh, the club into what it is today uh he hosted a lot of meetings and uh we would get together the third saturday of every month 
uh, we'd uh, make a beer and we'd sample the the month's previous beer, right. and, and then you're, we you're literally making the beer at home. At home, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It was it it was he lived at this he rented a place in downtown Oshawa. It was uh, uh, not the best neighborhood uh, right downtown, and you know it was. <laughs> Pretty yeah. interesting. The first time I went, I was like, "Man, I'm I feel like I'm gonna get shivved and you know yeah. sold off into white slavery." It, it, uh-huh. it was really so seemed kind of dodgy. Street then. Uh, <laughs> we're one street. We're one street to the west of. Okay, yeah, 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 we know the area. Yeah. So, but you know, we we went. We would make a beer and drink a lot of beer, and then when you the first few meetings, we always said it. Your mug got bigger and bigger, and then you realized you're drinking too much, so it got smaller and smaller. So the guys uh-huh. who go to the meetings now, it's like you. The, the, you bring a small so you can sample you a bring lot. that craft right. beer sample yeah. cup that yeah. they usually give at the festival that's right yeah yeah because yeah. you, you will yeah. when Success. we first started there was only about maybe five or six people that would show up at the meetings and uh, you'd, you'd drink for about eight hours while you made the beer because typically a home brew would take anywhere from well if you've been drinking and socializing it would take about four to five hours uh, but then you'd have like an hour lead up an hour clean up and then you just stay until you drank all the beer right mm-hmm. and then the, the third Sunday of every month they spent on the couch uh, mm-hmm. It was a real disaster, and uh, it was. But the the great thing is, is when you get a bunch of like minded people together. You know, like I'd I'd never been a part of a group before, and I'd never, you know, I never did lions, I never did a rotary, I never did you know scouts or beers right, or no anything like that. Yeah. So I go to this one and. There's all of these people that are interested in the same thing. And I'd been brewing. I'd got my first homebrew kit when I was 17. Um, There's a place in Oshawa called The Little Winemaker. And my yep. brother had just gone off to college. And uh, it's where the bulk barn is now, I think. Or it used to be a bulk barn. Anyways, by Teddy's. And there was a sign that said, you know, make 50 or 60 beers for... I don't know, 20 bucks or something, right? So my brother just, he turned 19 and got off to college. I went and I saw my mom. I, I went to my mom. I said, Mom, I got this great idea for Eric for his birthday. And I was like, let's let's go down and I need you to come with me. So I drove down there with her and I said to the guy, I'm like, yeah, you know, I brought my mom, you know, I'm 17, right? And they go, oh, man, you can be any age and buy homebrew equipment. I'm not selling you beer, right? So I was like, oh, okay, great. So I bought this homebrew kit for my brother. And I sent it, I gave it to him for his birthday. He went off to school and he started making beer at school, but I started making beer at home too, right? So at 17, I started making beer. And at the time it was, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, and you really couldn't have access to good good equipment and uh, um, good uh, ingredients at all. The ingredients right, just right. didn't exist. The what, internet, we were talking earlier really about internet. For you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it was usually those Cooper's kits, so you opened up the can and you put the brown goo in and you, you added water to it, and if you wanted a higher alcohol beer, you added more sugar to it and uh, stirred it up, added the yeast, and it, you know, sometimes turned out, sometimes didn't. Most of the time, it tasted really terrible. Oh, uh, so it was a pre... So like whatever company made it was like they made it with the hops and everything and it was just like everything was in it. Yep, just the it yeah, was liquid malt extract and then you added sugar to boost up the alcohol. Uh, and yeah. so it was yellow. It was carbonated. It yeah. gave you the worst farts in the world. It was god awful for your <laughs> GI tract, but it did the job. Uh-huh. Right? It got me drunk. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I made my very first beer, uh, that was it. I was there was something about the process that got me hooked. Uh, you know, you you feel like a magician or a wizard. You know, you're uh, all it is is just adding ingredients and water, and you add a little bit of yeast, and then boom, you've yeah. got beer, right? So, unfortunately, through high school, and to any teacher that is out there that teaches chemistry or biology in high school, teach how to make beer or wine, because I did not pay attention in chemistry class, but it's an insane amount of chemistry, and I had to relearn all of it. If I had had something that caught my interest, like, you know, the, this, you know, sacrification and, uh, you know, the cleaving of, uh, of um, the saccharide bonds, that sort of thing would have drawn me in because I knew I could, you know, I could understand how to make beer. I had to learn all of that afterwards. Right, yeah. But, you know, so, so I'd been fermenting. I lived in Niagara Falls for a few years and I'd been, you know, going to the cherry orchards and peach orchards and I was making wine and beer in my, you know, in my closet at school. Uh, it, you know, all of my housemates loved the fact that I had all this beer kicking around. Most of it tastes like shit, so it, it was not great. But some of it did, and some of it worked out. But then the internet comes along, right? So the internet comes along, and now you start to get access to ingredients. Mm-hmm. You don't have to know somebody at Molson. People start getting on message boards and talking. And that was part of the, the yep. whole purpose of Durham Homebrewers Club was really to, to source good ingredients and right. to find fresh ingredients. Um, and then if somebody found out about it, they would be like, oh, you got to go see this guy. He's got good grain. 
And then that guy, the, the local homebrew shop, would start making more money and buying better ingredients, getting fresher ingredients, and then start expanding. So it, it benefited everybody to have this group. Absolutely. So we all met, and our, our beers were good, you know? But then they started getting better because we started talking and sharing information and sharing sites and books and, you know, uh, kind of picking apart each other's beer. So we all came as brewers and as home brewers. Uh, I was doing it on my porch. Uh, Mike was doing it in his garage. Ed was doing it in his backyard. Spencer was doing it in his garage, you know. So we all had different techniques. We all had different styles and, and we were drawn to different beers. And we started uh, uh, getting together and you make that, the first time you make a beer, that is as good or better than something you can buy from the LCBO or the beer store, you're convinced. You're like, mm -hmm. I, I can open up a brewery because this stuff's better than yeah. stuff I can yep. buy, right? Yeah. And uh, the reality is, is you usually sober up in the morning and you go, oh, man, that was a crazy idea, right? Like, it's <laughs> that's, there, I should not open up a brewery. And usually after a conversation with your wife, you know, it's like, don't open a brewery. <laughs> so, you, you know, but Mike had a plan. Mike really was the guy who had the plan. And... Uh, he started meddling really well in a lot of the homebrew competitions. Uh, we all started meddling and, uh, you know, getting, when you, when Mike was on his way to actually get, becoming homebrewer of the year because of the amount of medals that he was winning. And it was amazing. Every time the standings came up, you'd see Mike's name, bang, bang, bang. He'd be, he'd meddle with a number of beers. Uh, but then he kind of came to me and he goes, hey, Ian, I got this idea for a brewery. And I, you know, we were, it was at one of the Durham Homebrewers meeting. We were in Brooklyn and I was very drunk and I was like, man, I don't have a million dollars. Take a hike. You know, I, I told yeah. him to take off. Yeah. And uh, that was the end of the conversation, I thought. And then a month later, Mike came, came up and he goes, no, man, I got this idea for, for a microbrewery, right? Like a really small brewery. I'm like, listen, I don't have half a million dollars. He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> Like a nano brewery, right? I'm like, how the hell can a nano brewery work, right? Like, what? I'm gonna homebrew and then make. You can't make money off of that. He's like, well, just, just, you know, I, I got an idea. So we were going to Ottawa uh, to drop off beers for um, the Ottawa homebrew competition, and Mike's like, you gotta come. He told me to take the day off work. I just got a new job. It was like I thought Shangri La. I was working at York University. It was a unionized position. I my kids were gonna go to York for free. I was hook line and sinker yeah, yeah i was set and uh you know I, I i couldn't get fired and uh you know it was gonna all of these great benefits for my kids my kids were gonna have straight teeth my kids were gonna you know have anything that they needed i was i was on that path of of, of you know uh, amazement but mike's like you got to come to ottawa uh we're dropped off take the day off we got to go see these guys there's this brewery called broadhead brewing in ottawa i'm like okay well i'll, I'll take the day off just to see mm -hmm. just to see right so we get there, and Mike's, they had just moved from uh, a 100 liter system, four, I think it was like five or 600 square foot facility, into a 2,000 square foot facility with a 1,500 liter system. So they had jumped, right? Yeah, a huge jump. jump. Mm -hmm. And it, they had went from brewing for one year on a 100 liter system to a year later jumping up to something that size. Now they're in the LCBO and they're all over the place, right? So we go there as they're moving, and they had had to, at the time, you couldn't have two locations unless you made a million liters of beer a year. So they surrendered their license, and they were, you know, in between. Anyways, Mike comes in, and he's got this, you know, he's got all these questions, and he's asking them all these questions, right? And even the, the guy at Broadhead said to me, he goes, wait a minute, where are you guys from? And Mike's like, I'm just a home brewer. You know, I'm kind of interested. And, uh, you know, I was, I had no idea where these questions were coming from. <laughs> and uh, the guy's like, are you sure? You kind of seem like you're asking some questions that, like, an official would know, right? You're like, are you from CRA, AGCO? Right? He's like, no, no, I'm not. I'm nope. just a home brewer. Just kind of curious, right? So at the end of it, you know, Mike had t asked all these questions and they were all about licensing and the, the steps you had to do, who you had to call. I was, I was like, man, this is really, really weird, right? Uh, so we get out and he goes, well, what did you think of that? I'm like, wow, man, great, good for them, you know, amazing. And he goes, well, I've been working on some numbers. I'm like, yeah, 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 Mike. And he goes, no, seriously, look at these. And he pulls out a folder on the hood of his car and opens it up and he's got some numbers, right? He's actually run a budget. And he goes, we could do it with, you know, a small investment. We could actually make this work. And the idea being open up a brewery, not quit our day jobs. If it does grow, great. If not, we don't have enough skin in the game to lose our house, right? Yeah. So I was like, oh, man, okay, well, we need more people, right? Because I still can't afford this. I just got a new job, you know? And I was like, I, I don't have any savings. I got no money. And uh, so then we drive home. And I go to my wife and I say to her, I'm like, man, look at this. We got this opportunity, you know, this, you know, and I'm like, ah, I don't know. I'm not fully sold on it. She goes, well, just don't, you don't have to make your decision now. Think about it. So Mike goes, continues to, to kind of work behind the scenes. And he wasn't really, 
Um, I had said to him, I go, I don't know, man, I don't know if I can do this. I just got this new job. I had only been working there for like six months. And I'm like, I, I don't know, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going down a new path in my life, right? <laughs> so I kind of said to him, I don't know if I can do this. And he's like, okay, all right, well, just we'll, we'll think about it. So he, he kind of got together with a few other guys, um, almost did an interview process for a number of people, right? And then they had a meeting, and I, I didn't know about, and they, he came, called me up, and he brings, he says, Ian, can you come by my house? I got a, you know, I, I've got a couple beers I want to trade with you, right? So I, I go back to his house, and we, we were talking beer. And he goes, listen, I had a meeting with Spencer and Ed, and we really want you to be a part of it. If you can't be a 25% owner, we want you to be like a 10% owner, but we really feel like you'd be a, a good asset, right? And I think it was because I owned a trailer and they they didn't, they needed to pick up a lot of equipment, right? <laughs> so <laughs> if you're ever opening up a brewery, find a guy that owns a trailer. You uh -huh. need it, right? For any of the Kijiji finds. So you you also said your background's in a horticulture. It was, yeah, yeah. So that, that kind of helps, doesn't it? It does help. So there, there are a lot of aspects to, to it, it wasn't just the trailer thing. I, I jokingly say that, but it is true. I was used mainly for my trailer for the longest time. <laughs> Uh, I offered anytime anybody needed to pick something up in Waterloo or London, I would always be like, "Hey guys, you can borrow my trailer." They're like, so no, 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 it's okay. You can just just go pick it up. So I guess you've helped a lot of people move then. Uh, unfortunately, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hate moving people. Yeah. Around. So, it, but it, the the great thing is, so he he goes away and he he says, "You got You got to be a part of it." And I said, "Okay, you got to let me think about it, right?" And so I went home and I was having a beer. It was a Friday night and I was talking to my wife and she goes, "Well." Imagine a scenario where they open up a brewery and you're not a part of it. How would you feel? And I, yeah. I said, I will tell you right now, honestly, if they open up a brewery and I'm not a part of it, I will quit drinking beer forever. I will never make another beer. I will, And my life was making beer. I, I made 37 beers in a year. So every weekend I was making 20 liters of beer. Mm -hmm. And I said I would stop making beer. I would stop drinking beer. And I would be done with it. Yeah. The whole everything. Uh, and I was honest about it. I was very honest about it. I, I, I wouldn't, it's not that I felt, would have felt left out. I would have felt a, a lifelong regret that I wasn't a part of it. So you always, you always regret the chances you don't take. Yeah, yeah. So I said, okay. And she's like, well, it's obvious. We got to make it work. And I was like, okay. So I called up Mike and I said, listen, I, I can't quite get together all of the money that you're asking for today, but over like the next six months yeah. or seven months, I can I can plan it out, right? Mm -hmm. Most of it went on my credit card, which I have yet to pay off, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. it, it, it's, 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 it's coming debt management. <laughs> 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 but, you know, I we we did it. We He had the plan and we stuck to the plan. And there was a couple of times where we had to go back and find some more money, but not a lot. Uh, we found a lot of great stuff on Kijiji. Um, there was uh, old mm -hmm. wineries mm -hmm. that went out of business, old homebrew shops Hell that went yeah. out of business. Oh, yeah. uh, I was going all over Hell's Half Acre to find this equipment, and it was, you know, okay, Ian, uh, I just heard from this guy. You're out in, you know, I was out at York University at the time. He's like, I got this guy in Mississauga that's got a real cool tap. Uh, he said that he'll do it for 100 bucks. Go get it right now. And I'd have to, you know, leave work and go straight down and pick it up and, and then, or h hook up my trailer. The amount of times I hooked up my trailer in the worst possible, it seemed like every time I went to pick something up, <laughs> it would be in London during a snowstorm, right? Like uh -huh. I had the worst possible weather on the 401. So it was never like a three hour trip. It was always a 12 to 16 hour trip to pick up a piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah. But we got it all pulled together. It took us forever. And the, and the landscape at the time was very empty out in Durham region. There was nobody. Yeah. Right there was Dur County Durham. Bruce was out uh, doing uh, his thing, but he's a one-man show, and and he he didn't have a chat room, and we wanted to have a little bit more interaction with with people, and that was kind of the key for us is to have that interaction um, because we love talking about beer, and we're convinced that there was people that wanted to talk about beer. Mm -hmm. um, so, you the best pint of beer you could get in all of Durham region five years ago was at uh, Royal Oak. And uh, the Royal Oak had uh, uh, Fuller's ESB and Fuller's London Pride on tap. And that was the best. In all of Durham Region were two imports at, uh, at an English pub. So think about the landscape. And th at the time, there was uh, Amsterdam, Great Lakes Brewery, Muskoka, Bose. Like, they were all, all right. they existed. Yeah. But nobody in Durham Region, Pickering to Bowmanville to Port Perry, had anybody local on tap. Right. So the day that we uh, we announced, or the weekend after we announced that we were going to be opening up a uh, uh, a brewery, um, Great Lakes Brewery had the first keg of uh, Harry Porter and Vanilla Bean, I think, uh, come out to Durham Region, and we were all just right. like, man, this is great! Like craft beers coming to to Durham Region, right? Yeah. 
And uh, so it was an empty landscape, and we, we really wanted to open Durham. We looked in Oshawa. Oshawa, it, even still to this day, is still somewhat prohibitive of, of opening up a brewery for some reason. Hmm. Uh, but Whippy was open for business. They were like, yep. you know, go for it, right? So we were all Durham boys. We wanted to do it locally. I was driving an hour to get to work. Mike was taking the train to get to work in downtown Toronto. Ed was uh, working in Pickering, living here in Whitby. Uh, Spencer was working downtown Toronto and uh, for FedEx yeah. and also working or living out here. So we all wanted to have a, a lot less commute. Uh, but we knew that as a community, Durham really needed something that was better. So uh, we start the process of opening up and at the time we really had to walk through a lot of people so we had to walk the through the town through how to open up a brewery uh, so we ended up knowing more about the the laws around opening a brewery and running a brewery than anybody else out here mm -hmm. uh, so we we were able to get licensed we got open it took seven months from when we signed our lease to when we could open up and sell beer it was a very long extended process mm -hmm. and so the whole time hemorrhaging money paying our lease you know, building a brewery, the whole thing. And it was just, it, the stress levels were through the roof. And it was a very small, small that's, brewery. That's a long time to be, like, not making money on the business. Yeah, we, paying it out. yeah and that's the thing is, is that it's, until you get licensed, you can't make it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you can, I can, you know, we were trying to sell t-shirts, but, you know, you buy the t-shirts for 15 bucks, you're selling them for $25. Yeah. Yep. You're right. making $10 a t-shirt, you sell 10 to your buddies. Right. 100 bucks isn't going to cut it when you're, you know, you're paying $1,300 for your, your lease. And, and we had only leased a small little area, it's about 900 square foot. So it, it was tough and we were pulling out a lot of hair. There was very, you know, the ulcers were, were large by the time that we got licensed. And when you talk to them and you ask you, okay, well, when are we gonna license? They're like, well, I can't tell you, it's in the process, it's in the process. They, they have no guidelines for it. And we hit every possible snag. In fact, the CRA agent that was supposed to be doing our inspection passed away. Oh my God. The day, wow. the day of our inspection. Oh, so man. that was, and I spent two weeks trying to call them you know, and at first I was like, hi, it's Ian from Five Paddles. Uh, you missed the meeting, you know, yeah. is everything okay? And then after two weeks, I'm like, man, can you just return my phone call? This is crazy, right? And then yeah. I finally called the 1-800 number and they were like, uh, yeah, um, the agent passed away, right? We can't get into her computer. And I was like, oh my God, I'm such a dick, right? Like I felt like such a horrible person for getting so mad. Most people would take, so, that, most people would take that as a sign not to open a business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life lesson is, yeah. Do, you know, do not assume that somebody's dodging you. Yeah, right. <laughs> so... Anyways, the new agent that came in, she's now, she's been great. She's helped a lot of breweries, but we kind of had to, again, walk her through it because she had never been in it before, and we, we knew what the, the steps to do. So we get licensed. We start making beer, and then we open up to, to sell beers. June 10th of 2013, and uh, we didn't know what to do. Uh, I had been working like a dog at York, and I, I couldn't get the time off to actually be here, but Mike and Spencer stayed until 4 in the morning filling the fridge for our opening day. Wow. Our fridge was completely filled. I, I don't even know how many bottles we had. It must have been maybe about 800 bottles, which to us was like swimming pools of beer, right? Yeah, we're used yeah, to making hot. 20 liters at a time, and we're making 300 liters at a time now, and we had tons of beer, and we're, we're just like you know what how long do you think this is going to take to sell out you know like right. we're we're we're, <laughs> we're gonna have we had all of our beer ready at once and then you we had to wait another two weeks for more beer to be ready because it takes you know it takes time, it, it takes yeah, time yeah. to make it so we open up and we only did like a soft launch on social media you know facebook right. twitter instagram wasn't big at the time so it's just facebook and twitter and uh we didn't even um contact the local paper uh so the we opened up on a Tuesday, and the Saturday was the ribbon cutting ceremony with uh, all of the local. We we just kind of put it out there, and uh, uh, Pat Perkins from the mayor of Whitby at the time showed up. We had oh, wow. the uh, the mayor of Oshawa show up. Mm -hmm. Clarington showed up. Like all of these local wow, so politicians show up. showed up, That's right? Crazy. So it was really cool that they did. But we open up on a Tuesday and sell out all the beer in one day. It's really? all, all one gone. day. All gone. Everything's wow. gone. And Spencer was working by himself on two hours of sleep. And uh, he, he, he was calling, you know, and we're like, you know, sending messages to him where it's like, you know, hey, man, how's it going? And he's like, busy. You know, like, well, what does that mean? Right. So yeah. it, it was insane. It was a lineup outdoor. And so I ran down as soon as I was done work. I finished at 2.30 and then drove down there as fast as I could and stayed there until 7 o'clock selling beer. And it was all gone. It was insane. And then we had enough beer that when the, the mayor arrived 
on the Saturday we could sell a couple of bottles, but we only had maybe about a hundred bottles, and it went within forty five minutes of, of the wow. opening. Wow, that's ceremony. amazing, right? So yeah. it was really cool. So you're like, thanks for coming. See you in two weeks. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what it was, right? But we weren't making a lot of beer, but we had ten uh, percent stout, and we had a big uh, IPA that uh, you know you figure. Five years ago, four years ago, there wasn't a lot of big IPAs. That no, were there available, wasn't. Right? True, yeah. Uh, so a big IPA, big APA. We had a saison and uh, an ESB, right? Like so, we had a, a bunch of really cool beers, uh, but a ten percent stout, right? That we were selling for ten dollars a bottle, um, which was unheard of. What's you know? a uh, sorry? What is for any people that know you, saison and uh, what was the last one? Oh, ESB, an, an English special bitter. Okay. Yeah. So it's a saison because I honestly I, I'm. I've actually, I only heard about it uh, a few weeks ago. I think at the craft beer festival in Toronto. Never. What? Yeah. So explain a sa- what a saison. Uh, a saison is a, a, a very traditional style of beer. It would be typically brewed uh, in, in Europe um, in the summertime. So it's kind of brewed hot. Normally, you know, a long, long, long time ago, you would brew in the winter time when it was cool, and then sell your beer in the summertime. So this was actually brewed in the summertime. So it ended up uh, being more. Uh, more flavor coming out of the yeast. So you'd get um, uh, really dry beer, lower alcohol, usually about three and a half percent. It was for the uh, workers in the fields to have while mm-hmm. they were bringing in the, the harvest uh, so that they could work, drink, and not get drunk, right? right. So uh, it's kind of changed over time as to what the expectations of a Saison is. Uh, the most classic example is a Saison Dupont that is uh, um, the from the Brasserie Dupont in, in uh, Belgium. And it is what should be a saison although now you can get nine percent saisons we do a raspberry hibiscus saison like we do all these fantastic by the way oh yeah it's <laughs> and so i mean it's it's been kind of modified over time just recently in the last like four or five years but yeah. traditionally that's what it was very dry crisp refreshing right uh big flavor as well See, uh-huh. I didn't know that. I kind of, I, uh, I avoided it because I had no clue what saison meant. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I'm just not going to bother taking that chance. Yeah. No, no, I did. I, now did. I, tried <laughs> it. I loved it. I yeah. took some home with me when we were here, and I was like, this is great. i got to buy more. Well, now that I know, I kind of want to try it now. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, I think it's the first time I had tried a saison, to yeah. my knowledge. Maybe I've had before, and I just didn't know, but that was the first time I had actually like, knowingly tried a saison, and I was like, this is really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I really enjoyed it. Well, so. it is summer, too, so that would make sense. Oh, well, yeah. It was a nice hot summer day when we tried it. <laughs> yeah, but let's not derail the, the the story that we were getting here. Oh no, no, I was, that's, that's I was zoning right down that <laughs> rabbit hole, man. I was coming in on we it. We derail stories yeah. all the time. Yeah, we do. Okay. So do I. I. Hey, you want me to talk about saison? We can change gears right now. I, <laughs> no, no, I want to keep hearing so about this. So to, to point of the the learning about the saison and, and that sort of thing, there are a ton of styles that that you know modern brewers are starting to pick up on that are traditional and they're modifying it to to new standards right which is great and that's what the one thing that i love about beer is that when i did 37 brews in one year they were not the same beer 37 times it was 37 different beers right. and traditional styles new styles experimental ones but you know also trying to figure out the way that beer was made 400 years ago there's a there's a tradition a thousands of year tradition of making beer and to say that we know better now is is absurd and and you know the localized ingredients is is important and i mean it's 2017 i I get on the internet i just google it and i can find hops from anywhere in the world you know i can find grain from anywhere in the world yeast from anywhere in the world the the water profile for uh, you know, uh, Ghent in Belgium. Like, y- you can find anything that you want. It's all at your fingertips. So you can recreate a beer mm-hmm. from, you know, 200 years ago and mm-hmm. have it to style exactly the way that it was made back then. Or even to recreate a style that's being made in Czechoslovakia. You can make it here in Ontario because you can recreate all that stuff. That's that's Which the cool amazing, thing though. about that's brewing, amazing. right? We know a lot right now, but there is a huge tradition. Uh, the problem is, is that a lot of new brewers uh, and our generation of, of brewery owners, they went down that rabbit hole of you know finding out everything you can about the history of beer and beer styles and all that kind of stuff. You start brewing them and introducing them and not a lot of the general public knows about them. So you do have somebody that'll come in and uh, you know, you'll get somebe from Germany that comes in and goes, "Oh my gosh, you got a goza. You know I remember having that when I was you know a little kid. I, I gave a, a, a Kolsch uh, style of beer to a, a friend at work. And uh, he was from Germany, and he can remember as a kid, uh, as a teenager, going down to the beer halls and having Kolsch in Cologne, 
and uh, eating a Limburger sandwich, right? So you're you're drawing out all of these things. Now, Kolsch is somewhat new in uh, Ontario's terms, but it's a very old traditional style. Right. So it is kind of cool that that the the world is is uh, getting smaller when it comes to specifically craft beer, um, and the knowledge base is getting bigger. But there is still a lot of trying to convey that knowledge, and that's there's what we wanted to do. There's an education. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And five paddles, we really wanted to do that. We love talking about beer with each other. We still do. Five years later, seven years of, of brewing together, and five, you know, five years of running a brewery together. We still love talking about beer. We still love geeking out about the the finer things, the minutia, the new hops that are coming, the new yeasts that are available, new styles like uh, milkshake IPAs and stuff like that. So these these are things that milkshake, yeah. yeah, milkshake IPA. So it's an IPA done with uh, a milk sugar, which is lactose. Uh, usually a few fruit puree, uh, pectin, and vanilla. So it actually looks like a milkshake. Wow. It has no the, way. but it's super hoppy, bitter, sweet, a little bit of vanilla, a little bit of fruit. It is the craziest thing, but what? the most incredible thing, right? Huh. So it's, it's wow. innovations like that that, yeah. that, are, that are really cool. And, uh, and we're able to do that here at Five Paddles because we're, we've always, we, we have to dedicate tanks to that because if not, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to get bored, right? Do you, do you think like yeah. like milkshake, your milkshake IPA, you think that's going a little bit too far at some points? Like, uh, do you look back, do you sit back and go, yeah, you know what, this is too much? I, I, I haven't hit a too much yet. Okay. I have hit a, uh, doesn't sound, sound good to me. Like we, we do have a rule of, if it sounds good enough, you can make it, whatever it is, right? Um, if it sounds interesting, if it doesn't sound, if it sounds gross, you kind of have to prove it to us before anyone's allowed to brew it. Uh, so uh, the best example that I always use is that, uh, um, so a Saison, right? Uh, Spencer had an idea for a Dijon Saison. Mm. And so a mustard Saison, right? I was like, oh man, that sounds really gnarly, right? <laughs> and uh, I'm like, you're going to have to prove this to me. So he's like, no problem. It's a, and I, now the name alone is an amazing name. Dijon Saison. Dijon Saison. Yeah. And I was like, all right, you got to prove it to me. So he brought in uh, some some uh, mustard powder, and he, we had a Saison that we, we sampled out, and we mixed some up in different you know concentrations, and even at the lowest possible concentration, it was really gross. And even Spencer Gree goes, whoop, that was a bad idea. So, you know, we kind of let that one slide. Uh, but... Yeah, it's uh, it, it it the innovations can be well. There's uh, recently a brewery I just saw did a uh, fried chicken uh, beer. They actually added fried chicken to it. Yeah, <laughs> fried fried Weird chicken stuff. chicken. Fried chicken. Yeah. <laughs> so you know I, when you see stuff like that, you go, yeah, is some of it going too far potentially? You know, but I'm curious. You know, you, you never know what's going to hit, and you never know what's going to be like. Our our we did a couple of hop shakes. And uh, the the milkshake IPAs they flew off the shelf, and the, the demand is very high for That's them crazy. right now. That. <laughs> so it, it is kind of cool, right? That, yeah. that that it's changed like that. Now there's two different levels. You've got that hardcore beer geek, you know, and we're all like hardcore beer geeks here. So we see those styles, and it's like, yes, we'll line up to pick them up. Um, but then you have a lot of traditionalists, right? And that's where I, I think the five paddles really fits well is that we can do both. We've got, right. we can cater to somebody that wants a, uh, you know, a, a kettle sour or a hop shake beer, but we can also cater to somebody who wants, you know, an, an, a traditional English bitter or a traditional Belgian double. Uh, so we're able to kind of do both, which is really cool. Uh, we do like to push the boundaries and we're, we're able to do that just out of pure curiosity. Uh, but it's also kind of flexing our, our muscles. Like we, we want to be able to, to do that. Um, so I think that's where, and we, we came out of the gates like that and we had a lot. So, okay. Going back to when we first opened. Yeah. yeah. Our, the idea was we were never going to brew the same beer twice. Cause we didn't do that at home. We didn't buy like that. I went to the LCBO and I, if I had an eight pack, I bought eight different beers and I, I didn't way. buy eight yep. of the same. Right. Yep, yep. And, uh, so mm. most people are like that now they look in their beer fridge and you don't see a six pack unless that's the only way you can buy that beer. And usually you have one or two out of it and the other four sit there for months. Yeah, right? There's only like a couple small, brand, well, not small brands. There's only a couple brands where I'll buy like a six pack. Mm -hmm. of that are not craft beer. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, I, I have uh, no problem going to pick up a six of Landshark. Mm -hmm. I like Landshark. Yeah. Um, there's a couple other beers that it's okay. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll have a... I'll have a beer of the generic brand beer. You know what I mean? Like Molson, Coors. I right. call them like the top brands, the yep. ones, the companies that were around when I was a kid. 
I'll have a small case of that in the fridge. Those are like the I don't care, you're a guest and you want a beer here, have this. Right. You're not yeah. having for my personal <laughs> reserve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you can't have my Saison because yeah. that's mine. Yeah. <laughs> there are friends that you you don't feel the need to educate them because yeah. they don't want to be educated. Yeah. So you're no. like, okay, you don't want it, that's no. fine. I'm not even going to try There's people anymore. that are like, Coors Light's my beer yeah, and you're yeah. not swaying me on anything. Yeah. Like, okay, here, have a Coors Light then. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, that, and that's great. There are there are people who are, are you know, they, they are really brand specific and, and yep. that's okay. I, There's a world for that. I, uh, when I, uh, I used to live in an apartment there in Oshawa and uh, my next door neighbor, Jay, knows about him, uh, drunk all the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, he would get Laker ice. Yeah. Cheapest, highest alcohol oh, yeah. content possible, yeah. right? Yeah. And I was like, hey, uh, you know, I'm not going to say his name. But I said, hey, I got, I got some uh, beer in the fridge. I can't drink it. Mm-hmm. And he's like, what kind is that? Grolsch. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Grolsch? What is that? Yeah, I'm yeah. Like, no, I said, it's really good, man. It's a, it's a high-end beer. And yeah. he's like, nah, sounds, sounds too fancy. I don't, I don't want that. And I'm like, dude, it's delicious. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a delicious great beer. beer. There's and it's a lager, and, and it's, you know, yeah. yeah. There's a guy at my work that it. does the same thing. He's like, he buys the cheapest beers because he can buy a ton of them for cheap. But then he says to me, he's like, yeah, but my, uh, it's not my favorite beer, though. My favorite beer, I don't know what he said, like, maybe Alexander Keith or mm-hmm. something, right? He's like, but that's like 2 or $3 more than what I pay. Yeah. I'm like, well, what can you sacrifice <laughs> yeah. one day a month? Yeah, to buy your case of beer that you like. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's like, like no, so don't buy that pizza that night. I, at Christmas, I'll buy Alexander Keats, right? Or, or you know, I got a bonus at work. But but I did that when I was younger too, right? So I would drink. Uh, you know, there there was. I actually hit a point when I was probably in my late twenties that I, out of pure frustration, I gave up beer because all there was was the large macros. There was, I, I lived in Port Perry. The Port Perry beer store was terrible. The liquor yeah. store was non-existent. I had had all the imports that you could get at the LCBO, and I, I had had it. I, they, they, they weren't bringing in Cremor anymore for me, so I said, okay, I'm done, right? Cremor's really Cremor. good. Yeah, so I gave, up on, I gave up on all beer for about a year and a half. I drank nothing but red wine for a year and a half because it was wow. frustrating, right? Like, you had nothing but garbage. And I got sick and tired of buying a case that came with a T-shirt or came with a hat, and it's like, yep. I need another Molson T-shirt or I need another, you know, whatever hat. And I was like, ah, I'm done with all this. So I did give up drinking beer for a while out of pure frustration. But then, then got back into brewing again, and then that kind of like really took me down well this this avenue, right? I had, I, I totally I, I same way. I you go in the beer store, twenty four case of twenty four for like, I end up spending forty bucks to thirty five bucks on it, and it's mm-hmm. like. I don't even like this beer that much, but I gotta buy it. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's funny that you mentioned Creamer. It's one of my favorite beers, mm-hmm. and uh, that was what—that's uh, what started me on my craft beer uh, yeah. journey, I guess you could say. Because I was—I was somewhere and I saw Creamer, and I'm like, hey, you know what? I'll try this. And I think at the time I got a, a Sapporo as well, because I hadn't seen Sapporo in a, uh, around, so I got those two, mm-hmm. and. Uh, that was it. I was, yeah. I was just like, I don't care about these other ones now. I remember the first time I had a Cremor, and it was back when they had the screw tops, the 500 mil screw tops, and uh, I was blown away because I had so much flavor. In retrospect, it's it's still yeah. an easy drinking beer, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it blew my mind. And then they had their Urbach come out one year, and that was it. I was yeah. just, I had no <laughs> idea what was going on in my mouth. Yeah. It was wild. So, it, so um, okay, so yeah. We, we decide we're not going to make the same beer twice. And as a result, after four years of, of brewing at Five Paddles, we've done over 160 different beers. So it's, it is always changing. Every week, there's always something new. Now, of course, over time, you do have people that you need repeat, repeatability and you need to have beers coming that, that they want. So there was a few places that kind of got on board. Village Inn in Bowmanville is really good. Tap and Tankard here in Whitby is really good. Um, they were like, yep, new beers every time, no problem. Just keep them coming. Uh, which was amazing. I, I didn't think that they would do anybody would do that, but they they did it, and we did get told no a lot. So a lot of local places, hey, new brewery in Whippy, we want to have you on tap. What's what's your beer? Oh well, we've got this this week. Well, what about next week? Oh no no no, we won't have that for I don't know when. And it's like oh well, I need to have the same beer. What if they come back in and they ask for you know your uh, your IPA and you don't have it? I don't have it. Well, how how can you run a business like that? And there was a few tongue-in-cheek comments. We went to an Ontario Craft <laughs> Brewers Conference, and there was a few little things where there were some of the older uh, beer writers, beer journalists, yeah. that uh, you know did the, uh, well, 
you know, oh, there's five paddles. Uh, you know, Steam Whistle knows how to do it because they make they do they do it right. They make one beer really really well instead of all of these other beers that you know other these new breweries are making, right? right. And so we got a little tongue, a couple of tongue in cheek kind of you know uh, pushes back and that sort of thing um, from some of the uh, the the pillars of of brewing in the in the community uh, because it is changing the way you make business. I, I look at it now, and we're making 300 liters at a time, but now when you're doing 2,500 liters at a time, you can't just, well, you could. You, in the landscape five years ago, you could not just do whatever the hell you wanted with, right. with trying to shift 4,000 you know, cans or bottles or whatever, uh, because most of those breweries were set up to sell to the beer store or the LCBO or the licensees. It wasn't coming in the front door, and most people didn't go to breweries. Uh, now people do. People yeah. travel to go to breweries, right? So mm-hmm. it's we were we, you know, we had a lot of the uh, uh, breweries that had been around for about ten years come through, and a lot of the sales guys and a lot of the uh, people that work there are like, man, this is great, you know, a front room, and you you know, you can talk to the people and serve the beer. This is fantastic, right? So they they really jumped on that and said, we got I got to go back to my boss and tell him we have to do this, right? So it was, they were in an industrial park, and so we're in an industrial park now, mm-hmm. uh, but. You know, it's a destination for people to go to. They can sit, and thank goodness that they they've been able to through a, a lot of government initiatives. So things like um, the Ministry of Tourism did a buy the glass license. So now I can serve a 12 ounce glass, a 355 or 353 mil serving of beer, uh, as long as it's within certain hours. Um, and that was for they did that to uh, uh, promote beer uh, breweries and wineries. So as to bring people in to stay longer in an area. I'm not doing food, so I'm not taking away from any restaurant, but I do have beer and it brings people, you know, uh, from Ottawa, Toronto, they do come to the brewery, which is cool. So through some of those initiatives, it really did help to build the whole front room idea uh, at breweries. So a lot of the older guys are like, geez, now we got to build a front room. And a lot of them are like, "Eh, I don't even like talking to people, right? Like people that are in brewing are a very odd bunch. And most of the brewers, they seem to be kind of on the spectrum anyways, right? So uh, they love their their focusing on their beer and, and doing their brewing. But I mean, to have somebody like me that's like, you know, right in your face, you know, yelling at you about beer it's uh it's not too common that's usually saved for some of the sales guys right and uh you know to to have that beer psychopath really really you know just diving at you is pretty pretty intense sometimes but a lot of those breweries are not set up that way you know you have guys that are uh they're um uh chemists and uh, biology phds and or masters and uh accountants and stuff like that that are opening up breweries and they're not really that crazy personable type thing so we wanted to really have that and that's what we've tried to cultivate here at five paddles so you you do see that and we we tour we uh try to as a group do um we call them uh, vision quests where we travel to other breweries in ontario or sometimes into the u.s just to see how other breweries conduct their business and every time we go out to other breweries and 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 talk to people that are working at, at other places you realize the camaraderie that you have we are all in this together, yeah. you know? Like 97% of the beer sold uh, on the planet is not made by a small craft brewery, you know, 3%. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 some of them have better, you know, there are better numbers, but it averages out. And uh, it's like one out of every two beers consumed on the planet is owned by AB InBev. So like there, there's a lot of macros out there and we're all trying very hard to, we're not fighting against that, but that is what, people's palates are used to right. so there is a camaraderie there mm-hmm. the other thing is is that it, it allows us to see how uh, other front rooms are conducted and we realize that at, at five paddles like we we are really invested in the people that come through the front door uh, there's a lot of people that have been able to uh, all of the guys that work here other than the owners uh, were fans of five paddles before they got the job here so they were customers and every time we post for a job we're always like eh, you know we never know who's gonna come and it's always somebody where you're like man don't you have a real job why the hell do you want to come work here right? yeah. <laughs> and they're always like well I talked to you guys and you guys are so crazed about this like it's just infectious right and it's kind of cool that that the the they are now working here and they are not only financially invested in the in in the brewery as as to get a paycheck but they're also emotionally invested in the brewery because they we give everybody that right to say to not to say the beer's not ready you know if you're you know the the bottlers they i talk to them all the time about i say to garrett and aaron i'm like well what do you think about this beer is it ready 
and uh, they're like, eh, maybe another day, or you know, maybe give it a little bit more, maybe this needs a dry hop, right? Right. So I, I trust them because they they are emotionally invested in the product that's going out the door. Uh, I trust uh, uh, anybody that works here to to make those decisions. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, uh, higher up now that we're in the LCBO, in the beer store, you know, all that kind of stuff, you do have to look at it and go, okay, well, you know, I do have to sometimes make a financial decision. Uh, but it's never been that way with, with recipe development. It's always been, this is what I want the beer to taste like. We make the beer and then we go back and go, oh, geez, man, fresh raspberries are really expensive. <laughs> I really wish I didn't yeah. put in 200 yeah. pounds, right? Uh, so, y- y- you know, you have some even some of our barrel programs where we'll, you know, we'll get a barrel and it'll be a $300 US to buy a barrel. And you, you know, you get one or two uses out of it and that's it. You're not making any money off of it, but it's, even though the bottle's very expensive, like we'll sell it for 10, 12, uh, $13. Um, the, the reality is, is we're not recouping any of our, our cost on that. It is just for the sake of having something cool. Uh, if we age a beer for a year and a half in a barrel, it's it's not making any money. You know, it's taking yeah, up floor space true. forever. Yeah. Uh, you know, even the tanks that sit f- uh, filled for two or three months, we could turn over three beers in that time. And uh, but you know, we're doing it because we want a product that's going to be good at the end of it. Right. Um, yeah. And that's really the the whole point to, to us. It's always been beer first, <laughs> and uh, you know have a place that we want to hang out at because I liked hanging out with these guys. I still do, but I still want to have some cool stuff. So, you know, we play cool music and we have, you know, cool surroundings and we surround ourselves with cool people so that we can actually have a good time at work. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lots of beer. Yeah, yeah. And the funny thing (laughs) is that we jokingly say that Five Paddles doesn't run on beer. It runs on coffee. That coffee maker is going nonstop. We drink so much. We we you, yep. you have to play the part sometimes and be like, yeah. Everybody says, oh, I'd love to work at a brewery. I could drink beer all day. You're like, yeah, it's great. I drink beer all day, uh, but you don't. You you drink a lot of coffee all day. Sometimes uh, you just want a glass of water. You know. Yeah, yeah. Coffee. You do need to rehydrate occasionally. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> we do have a couch upstairs. We got a nice fold out couch that there's if anybody an needs a nap. Here? Yeah, there's a mezzanine. Holy cow! Uh, it's <laughs> mainly where me and Spencer stare at each other over uh, laptops. Now mm-hmm. it started off when we were when we first opened. We did everything, the bottling, the brewing, the the selling, everything, and now it's uh, a lot of Excel spreadsheets. It's. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I never thought that I got to this point. And Spencer jokingly said to me, he goes, hey, and you ever think that we get to the point where it, uh, our job would be data entry? Yeah. <laughs> data entry, yeah. Uh, Were we supposed to hire somebody for this? This is total BS, man. we got to change this up. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it is part of it, right? And the one thing... I always, I, I've used this quote a number of times and I, I stick by it. I read a quote by uh, Julia Childs and the one thing that she said was, I love everything about cooking. I love, I love the meal plan. I love the recipe development. I love to go out and buy the ingredients and find the freshest ingredients. I love washing it. I love making the meal, prepping it, and I even like doing the dishes afterwards. And so if you can keep that in mind, and, th- and that's what I always keep in the back of my mind, and the truth is, is that I love everything about running this business. I did it when I first opened. I will mop the floor. I will clean the toilet mm-hmm. because I love this place, and I love right. everything that it stands for. So yeah. I don't mind doing data entry two or three days a week. It sucks. Uh, it is a controlled substance that we're selling. You know, alcohol is controlled. It's taxed yeah. at so many levels. 100%. You have to have some really good infrastructure in, and we've developed that over time. Uh, but uh, it, it is kind of it does take away from what I love to do. That was those are my Zen moments with brewing. That was my I'd wake up early on a Sunday morning and I'd have a I'd start brewing at about six or seven o'clock in the morning and then I'd be cleaned up and done by noon. But that was me, my alone time. I had young kids and I just wanted like some own my own space. Right. And the the best advice that I had I'd been given a, a long time ago was, uh, don't drink when you brew because you you're you will inevitably screw something up and i and it worked better for me because i would be getting up really early so i wouldn't by the time i finished i'd be like, okay everything's done clean up put away now i can have a beer. Can. Mm-hmm. and yeah. I, I worked with a guy from newfoundland and his, his missus used to always say uh beer goes in brain goes out and inevitably every time that i have a beer if i have a pint at lunch here and i'm working doing something i'll drop a bottle i'll knock something over and I, it's just such a it, it is true you know you can't run a brewery and be drunk all the time no. <laughs> even the data entry suffers if i do that my spreadsheet won't save oh, properly i, I don't know <laughs> 
Uh, so you got a. Uh, you said you had how many beers you brewed this year? Different beers, a hundred or something. Uh, it's, in the last four years, we've done over 160 beers. So um, uh, wow. you, you you do keep a stable of beers that you you go back to all the time. There are we we do have because uh, I know the home sweet home is always here. Absolutely, yeah. So over time, there is there is a restaurant here in Whitby called Chatter Paul's, and we just did an event for them a couple yep. days ago. Uh, and the manager there said, if you keep making Home Sweet Home, I will keep buying it. And uh, I was like, holy cow, we got our first like, and that's contract, a right? I was yeah. like, oh, oh man. Yeah. And the thing is, is that beer, we were when we opened, it was always like high alcohol, big hoppy beers, just insane things, right? And my wife said to me, she's like, you can't keep doing that. You have to have an offering that, you know, that the average you know, non-craft beer drinker can approach. Right. Uh, or the things, the thing that we saw a lot of was, and maybe it was just coming from my wife's standpoint, was wives and girlfriends that would bring their husbands around or boyfriends to a brewery. They would sample and they'd just kind of be like, oh, hoppy beer or 10% stout, a bourbon barrel-aged uh, barley wine. Be like, oh, that's kind of weird, you know? And because yeah. uh, my wife was like that. She's like, you need to have something to offer somebody else that, that the non-drinkers or the non-hardcore beer drinkers. So we... We developed the. Uh, I, I was talking to my uh, my wife had a honey wheat beer when she was in PI, and she's like, "That was an amazing beer. You got to do it." And I had this idea of this uh, vanilla beer. I had had a vanilla cream ale when I was in Niagara Falls a number of years back, and it was disgusting. But the concept was good, right? Yeah, it does and, sound good. Yeah, vanilla and cream. It yeah, really yeah. Good. Yep. Uh, it was terrible, but the concept it, it stuck in the back <laughs> of my head. And my brother and I, my brother in law and I, were sitting around having a beer over a long weekend, and I was like, "I don't know, should we do a honey honey wheat or vanilla wheat?" You know, I was like, I couldn't come up figure out which way to go. And he goes, oh, shitty, and just quit talking about it. Just do a honey vanilla wheat. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So I came in and told the guys, and they're all like, oh, seriously, man, a honey vanilla wheat sounds terrible, right? I'm like, just let me give it a try, and we'll see what happens. So we tried it. It was an immediate hit. Everybody loved it. And then people started requesting, and we're like, no, 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 no. We're five battles. We don't do it like that, right? We do whatever we want. And then they said, well, we want more, and we want it every week because we're going to you know, we're gonna sell it for you, right? And I'm like, okay, well, I, okay, maybe we'll do it, right? And it was selling out the front door, selling out the licensee doors into kegs, so it, it was kind of a no-brainer. And, and it was good, right? Like, we liked it. We liked it as a beer. It's changed over the years. We, we now still occasionally do an unfiltered uh, version of it, and uh, it had a lot more vanilla when we first started making it. And we do a uh, kind of like a, a throwback Thursday to, to Home Sweet Home occasionally where it's unfiltered and heavy vanillas, and it's really intense. And uh, now, yeah, LCBO, Beer Store, uh, most of our keg accounts are that beer. So that one, yes, we absolutely have home to sweet have like Home a Sweet Home. Yeah. It is a yeah. staple, yeah. We, for the first time in about six months, we ran out of it about a week ago. Uh, no, sorry, about a three weeks ago. We, we, we had seven or eight days where we didn't have it. And, oh, man, everybody was like, where's Home Sweet Home? You know, like all wow, going mad at us. Way. Yeah. Wow. So that's kind of cool. But it's as we've grown, it's been that beer in particular has been able to allow us to, with confidence, buy bigger tanks. Uh, to invest in into the brewery to, to grow because we know that we need to make more. So we ran out because the demand is so high, not for lack of brewing it. We make a lot of it. Uh, two of our, our 20 barrel tanks uh, are dedicated to Home Sweet Home exclusively. Mm. And it just, we can't keep up to it. And uh, it's the craziest thing and we try very hard, but we know now that it's like, well, we are going to have to get more tanks because there's more Home Sweet Home demanded out there. Mm-hmm. So it is kind of cool that it is something that allows us to keep the lights on and pay all the wages yeah. and then still allow us to buy a barrel from you know, so Prince describe, Edward County. Describe Home Sweet Home. What's what's uh, the taste and what is what kind of beer is it? So yeah, yeah it's well, a honey vanilla wheat, but it's it's right. uh, it, it's the closest thing that we have to a craft lager that we make. Okay. Uh, so it's, a, it's an American style wheat, so done with a very neutral yeast. Uh, it's got uh, honey malt, not real honey in it. Real honey just uh, thins out the body and boosts the alcohol. You don't really get a lot of honey character in a beer uh, by using honey. So the honey malt, it's a malting technique that actually adds that honey sweetness. Uh, then we use real vanilla beans, just on a very low level so that the honey and the vanilla kind of play off each other, but it has more of a very crisp, dry. Uh, we filter it now too, so it's nice and clear. Uh, big, thick, white, rocky head. So it's, mm-hmm. um, it is... I, I, I have a keg of it at home. I keep, every time I try it, we, you get so close to the beer when you're brewing it that uh, occasionally you look and go, ah, you know, you can't, it's hard to enjoy the beer because you're, you're always thinking, does this taste like it did two months ago? Uh, is this ingredient working properly? Is this, right. you know, like you're, you're, you're constantly thinking while you're tasting it, you're testing it and you're trying to pull out what's wrong with it, right? Because you want it to be perfect. 
but then if you can just sit back and open up a beer and have it, you can actually enjoy it for what it is. And occasionally, I, I always try to do that with Home Sweet Home, is that uh, I try to take home one bottle from every batch, uh, even though we, we do a lot of it. <laughs> and I have a lot of it at home. Uh, it, it is one of those interesting things that every time I, I come to it with an open mind, you go, man, that's actually a really good beer. Uh, it's a little bit beyond what the average lager drinker would, would have, but you know that's what makes it cool about craft beer, right? Some, uh, a brand like that can kind of create a life of its own and people can get behind it. So we've meddled quite a bit with it with the Ontario Brewing Awards. Um, so that's kind of cool that uh, that it's actually being accepted on a broader scale, yeah, uh, not just you know people's choice, <laughs> which it is the people's choice, but also like through beer judging and that sort of thing, it's actually right. being being judged and uh, and you know they've passed judgment on 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 us and we've meddled. <laughs> that must feel good winning an award for your beer. Yeah, it, it, you know when we first opened, we were like, "Whoa, we're gonna sweep the Ontario Brewing Awards, right? We sent in everything, and we thought everything's gonna come back." What do you think, guys? How many golds do you think we're gonna get? And we didn't win anything, you know. And it was a very humbling experience. We're like, "Whoa, man! I thought our beer is award winning. Everybody that comes in tells me it's mm-hmm. great, right? Yeah. You know, it's like mom tells me it's great, but." Uh, you know, we, we started uh, uh, refining our process and getting it better and still entering into the... Because uh, Mike is very big on the competition circuit, and he, he's right. It's, in order to be better, you have to, you have to be able to take criticism. You have to be able to make adjustments and mm-hmm. be better. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't be better by saying you're better you have to, or, or buying being better. You have to be better by actually doing it. So it. we we try very hard to do it and, uh, and taking the hits along the way. Oh so, yeah, you yeah. take a lot of hits, right? So last year, this year we got three medals at the Ontario Brewing Awards. Last year was kind of a really good year for us. We got five as well as uh, wow, really um, good. Uh, brew, uh, an award at the Canadian Brewing Awards. Um, so to be able to get that kind of feedback from from you know these judges and uh, I'm a, I'm a judge and Spencer's a judge as well, and uh, so you you know the the blind process that goes into it. Uh, it is kind of cool. Um, so we have been able to improve our process and make our beers better and to make it uh, uh, more metal worthy, I guess. Uh, but still, you know, being able to make beers that are, are not too style. There are problems with some of the competitions where they get a little bit too... We know that if we send in a, a Chipotle cranberry, you know, smoked porter, it's it's not even in a style. So they'll they'll look at it and go, okay, well, it's not a porter, it's not a fruit beer. Well, it's not really to a, to any specific style, so you can't meddle with it, right? So you do have to kind of sometimes brew to style, mm-hmm. um, and and that's the way sometimes we will pick our beers to go to competitions. But occasionally you just take it and throw like all sorts of crazy stuff in there and see what happens, right? And things like our Belgian double uh, getting a. Um, a silver medal at the Canadian Brewing Awards it was a big tap for us because I, 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 I designed that recipe trying to basically recreate West Mall Double which is you know a very classic style of, of uh, that style of beer and uh, to actually get tapped for that and being like yes you actually did it, it it's a pretty big deal because that was a two style beer and, and it was picked up and told yes it's good hmm. so that was kind of cool that, that's kind of cool where does, uh, where does the name Five Paddles come from? So when you make a beer, you use a mash paddle, right? That's what okay. you use to stir the mash. Um, so we all had that idea of, uh, you know, that we all bring our mash paddle to the brewery because there are four brewers that opened up Five Paddles. So it is kind of difficult sometimes because we, uh, you know, we all have different styles of making beer, but we all have to bring our own flavor to it. And it is kind of cool because sometimes you can taste a similarity with recipes uh, with breweries. So... You know, you can almost taste like it's like, oh, every beer has to have five or ten percent Abbey malt in it, right? And you, you just know that it's like, oh, that tastes like that that brewery. Uh, but for us, we've got four different brewers that are bringing their mash paddles to the brewery and brewing differently. Ed brews a lot of stouts and, and dark beers. Um, Mike does a lot of IPAs. I do a lot of uh, wheat beers and Belgian beers. Uh, Spencer's incredible at doing English beers. Uh, um, so by bringing all of those different things together and bringing those paddles together, we're able to kind of create it five paddles right but the idea also being that the beer itself steers the course and the that's what will make the brewery great and it, even though we're all going to throw everything we can at it the beer has to be good and that is like and it's a little bit like canadiana too right i always jokingly say that it's like a five looks better on a shirt than a four so where does the fifth paddle come in well that's that beer the beer is the fifth paddle beer is right the fifth it, paddle. It, oh, it, yeah. it 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 steers the course for for where we're going with the brewery yeah yeah 
Well, for people who don't know, you're almost you're almost open here, aren't you? We got people. Uh, we got customers walking in already. <laughs> yeah, we got customers walking in. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah it's uh, uh, you're bottling right now. Uh, what are you uh, What are you bottling back? There? Uh, right uh, now, we're bottling in your face. Uh, our IPA. Um, it's. Uh, it's on, the, it's on the wall here? Yeah, we've got it on the wall. It's an unfiltered IPA. We got a silver medal for that at the right. OBAs last year, I think. Brother, um, Brother Ian's Belgian, I think, as uh, yours. That's me. Student. Yeah, I'm Brother Ian. Right. I'm the one that designs all the Belgians. Um, yeah, here, let me just grab Garrett. Something for the front counter. Well, <laughs> man. It's a live show. This is what happens. This is what happens when we do a live show at uh, on site, but. Uh, <laughs> To let you know, uh, Five Paddles is absolutely amazing, and we talk about brewery tours and stuff like that. We are going to have an awesome package for you. Mm. You come to the uh, one-year anniversary party at the Galley Pub in Ajax, yep. um, and what we're going to do is we're going to give you, if you come to that party, we're going to give you and three of your friends a brewery tour, and at the end of the tour, you get a glass of beer. Yep. And that's, you get to pick your own beer. Pick pick one of the beers that they're brewing. they got a wall here you can check from, and... Uh, that's so you got to be at the party yeah the only way you can win that is you got to be at the anniversary party <laughs> yep that's right man. that'll be coming that's a that's a good uh, that's a good prize i mean I, that's something i'm gonna get on get in on too oh, you're, you're gonna get in on it too well i'm not gonna win the prize of yeah, course you're gonna, gonna make gonna one of your friends win no, it. i'm just gonna get on the tour <laughs> uh, oh you're just gonna show up <laughs> you're just gonna show up and be I'm like just gonna show up we're, we're the we're the host of this contest we got, <laughs> we got we're, we're automatic in yeah <laughs> unless <laughs> Unless Ian's gonna cut me off, and be like, "Nah, it's for four people." Four, five. <laughs> you can wait outside yeah. the front. This is how. Uh, there's no rules of five paddles. We, we we've established that for me, so it, it's okay. We can accommodate. Uh, yeah, that's a good prize, man. I am. Um, I, I like that prize. Yeah. So of for course, those everybody's been. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Everybody's been bugging me about uh, giving away alcohol prizes. Right. Everybody I talked to, like, Are you giving away beer yet? giving away like uh, a scotch whiskey I'm like what are you talking about is this like your brother and your dad or something no, like everybody oh, oh everybody yeah, my brother my dad obviously yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously. well <laughs> technically I'm not allowed to give away any alcohol no no, no. it's illegal right no, but, we're, but if you come to the brewery and do the tour we'll uh, sample. We'll, we'll just see what happens yeah, 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 yeah we'll yeah, say yeah. that it, it's the yeah. part of the tour the we'll ultimate see. gravity show will pay for it <laughs> yeah well we, we one, w- one way or the other somebody's gonna get beer yeah, and they're not going to have to pay for it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody will be cool. footing the bill. That's us. Um, but we're hoping that if you're listening um, from all over the world that you'll come to our anniversary party in our small yeah. little pub. Absolutely. So I expect to see whoever's listening from Japan to come over mm, August yeah. 12th, uh, the Galley Pub in Ajax. Yep. Absolutely. That's where we'll be. If, yeah. you, if you fly it's in five, from Japan to come to Fight Paddles. Uh, not yet, no, no. no? Uh, but if you fly in from Japan to, to and win that tour to come to Five Paddles, we will hook you up with... A, you know, very cool. <laughs> you Hell come yeah. to Japan. Yeah, we'll just we'll just we'll pay for you to go on the tour, even a, aside from the the contest. Yeah, <laughs> you oh, come yeah. to Japan. We'll just tour you around the area. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> heck yeah, man. But uh, what's um, so what what, uh, what what are your favorite beers other than your own? What do you what do you what do you like? Is it just is it, do you just drinks your own beers? No, 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 no. I I it's. <laughs> Uh, I, however, I do drink a lot of our beer. I, I do. I'm still a fan of beer. I yeah. love beer, and if I can find a traditional style yeah, so that I can kind of pull out what that traditional style is, uh, I just picked up a six pack of Pilsner or Kell last night, which is like a classic Pilsner. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, picking up a, a um, an original style of uh, an English bitter or picking up an original uh, you know pale ale kind of thing. Those things are really important for me to to find, and unfortunately a. Lot lot of that is imported in and it's you know old and you don't really get it fresh um but you know anytime i travel i always try to sample the beers when i'm traveling so i've been to belgium i've been to california you know we go down to the u.s uh you know by going to these places and having a a real uh belgian dark strong you know at, at a trappist monastery you're, you're having it fresh. You're having it the way that it's meant to be drank. Mm. Um, going to uh, California and having a fresh uh, IPA, having a, a California American style IPA, you know, it's it doesn't sometimes doesn't translate well just because of the way that the uh, the liquor is distributed or beer is distributed in Ontario. It doesn't 
it, it gets held and you know it's not fresh uh, so by traveling like that I think that uh, if you're really into beer and if you're really into getting more knowledge about beer by becoming a beer judge or Cicerone or Prudhomme training um, you know I, I really do feel it's important to travel uh, to, to find out what it's like to have a real one because and if, if not you know even just to have uh, to make something you know to brew to, to find out what it tastes like find that original recipe that that to me is very important so uh, it, it's we we had a, a couple come in and they dropped off a um, Dusseldorf alt beer uh, for us they were in Dusseldorf they bought it from the original alt beer brewery uh, this is what all of the alt beers in in the world are designed after uh, I've made one at home uh, Creamer has one uh, and I thought, okay, I, I remember making one, and then I went out and I bought the Creamer Alt beer, and I thought, okay, this kind of tastes similar. Is this what it should taste like? Because you don't know, right? Right. And they brought one from the original Alt beer brewery, and I did a side by side, and man, oh man, it was almost bang on. If you want to, wow. if you want to try a really good example of an Alt beer, get the Creamer. It yeah. is great. And the only difference is, is that the original one is a little bit more hoppy. That's the only difference. Uh, but by being able to try something that is fresh, that's from the source, you know, then you have a, a greater understanding of, of the, the beer itself because mm. it is a food product. Beer is meant to be drank fresh. I know a lot of people will buy big beers and age them and that sort of thing. And sometimes they can develop, you know, good characters. And sometimes right. beers do need to be aged because they're sold a little bit too early, a little bit too young. Uh, but really, especially here, whenever we release a beer, it's because we believe it's ready to be to be had. Um, it's very rare that we, I think maybe once or twice, we've actually sold a beer and said, ah, sit on this for a little while. Most of the time, it's like, it's go. It, it is yeah. go time. It is ready to drink. Yeah. So it is, uh, um, as um, far as styles around here, I think that I've gone through all of the seven the, stages of insanity with beer. Is that the compressor you've been talking about? Yeah, yeah. that's our compressor, yeah. yeah. It's pretty loud. It always kicks on. It, it shuts off fairly quick but right. it, it is one of those crazy things that i've gone through all of those insanities that you do so where you go oh well i only want double ipas or you know uh imperial stouts or aged in a bourbon barrel or white whale beers that are impossible to find you know get the heady topper or, or the tired hands or the pliny the younger you know you're you you need to find these impossible to find beers but now i'm at the point where i'm like you know what I had a steam whistle the other day and I was like, man, oh man, they really nailed this beer. Like, this is such a good beer. Yeah. And for a lot of beer geeks, and we do have a lot of them come through, I always say to them, it's like, yeah, you know, like something like Untapped. Untapped is kind of that weird sort of, you know, self-judging type thing and people will judge on it. And I, I love reading our Untapped reviews because a lot of them are just, some of them are just brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. um, Untapped is a... What, it's an app for your phone. Oh, okay. It's okay. an app for your phone and you you will find the beer, you will log into it and you'll give it a rating of one out of five. Uh, and then you can comment on it if you want. Uh, so when you start to see these things, you know, to have people say, oh, well, ah, I don't really care for Pilsners, you know, I'm going to give it a two out of five. I, I look at that and go, man, you know what? This is a this is a five out of five every day, man. Like this is a world class Pilsner. It's not exciting. You know, it's not mind blowing in the fact that it's has this crazy story of being aged uh, you know, at the top of a mountain, you know, volcano aged uh, <laughs> imperial stout. Uh, like none of them have these crazy long stories of how the beer got to you. Yeah. But the reality is, is as a style and as that beer that it is, it's an amazing beer. So right. I, I try to drink locally. And, and the one thing that I always kind of urge people to do, and I always use this one line whenever I go into a restaurant, I always say, well, what kind of local beer do you have on tap? So it's hard, like mostly call, yeah. worldwide, you know, it's, it's kind of normal, but over on, in Ontario, it's not been normal to have a local beer on tap up until the last, you know, in the last maybe 24 months uh, that most communities do have a brewery. So mm -hmm. it's important to support local, you know, we, we try to do that with all of our stuff, with uh, any, any of the stuff that we, we buy and use, all of our tap handles are made locally, all of our things are sourced as local as possible. Um, but that's because, you know, I, I look at it and I go, okay, well, the guy that makes my tap handles, you know, he, I, I know who he is. I know Chris. He's a great guy. You know, he's an incredible artist. And, uh, you know, it's, you, you have that better connection with them. So when you go into a restaurant and you go, okay, you're a local small restaurant, you're not a chain. And some chains are getting behind craft beer, which mm. is fantastic. And local craft beer. Yeah. Uh, we've got a couple here. Jack Astor's is one uh, in Whitby. They've got behind craft beer and, and they've seen an uptick in business. Uh, because the reality is, is a lot of us will choose where to eat depending upon what their beer menu is. So, you know, we always talk about that. We're like, oh, well, I went there because, well, 
as a backup, they had whatever craft beer that we can think of, right? Or, or a macro beer that's somewhat craft-like. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, no matter what, I'll have to go there because they got a good burger. But, yeah. uh, you know, you, you get the local guys and, you know, we support local guys and we, we're there for them. And, you know, we, we will deliver on time and they know who, they can call me up directly and be like, hey, man, I need another box of glasses and I'm there. But the, ma- the, the larger scale guys are starting to realize that, you know, you have a chain and they already have their business. So the typical guy that would go to any chain restaurant, whatever family restaurant you can think of. They have that person right now. Well, I don't go to a lot of those because a lot of them don't carry craft beer, right? Because a lot of the decision process is made at head office, right? The, the negotiation is done at very high levels. Uh, and they need to have consistency across all of their brands across the province or across the country. And uh, But I look at that and I go, well, I won't go. So automatically you've got about 3% of the population won't go to these restaurants because they don't carry local craft beer. And it's a small percentage but they're fighting for that 3%. They, mm-hmm. If they can see an uptick of 0.25% just because they throw on two craft beer taps, man. Yeah. There's, was, oh, someone's ahead. getting a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a couple times at work, people would be like, let's go for beers or whatever. Where do you want to go? And I used to want to go to Hop House mm-hmm. in Whitby because Hop House had craft beers on tap. Yeah. And they would cycle through. So they'd have a, a craft beer of the week, which makes sense based on local craft beers cycling beers through weeks on yeah. whatever the batch is right yeah. and they're like why do you want to go there it's younger people and it's you know sometimes it's too busy i'm like it has nothing to do with any of that yeah they have craft beer and i want to see what they have this week oh yeah right yeah. and i never realized that early on when i was like i went in there and i got um it was like a brock street something mm-hmm. and i was like oh i want to go back next week and get a brock street I went back they're like no we don't have that this week yeah what do you mean you don't have that i didn't <laughs> understand right and then it was like oh we have this and this they had something from Port Perry or something. Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'll try that. Yeah. I tried that. And then the next week, and I started to learn, oh, man, this is awesome. There's, mm-hmm. I could just go to one place and get something new every week. Yeah. It, it draws people back is yeah. the thing, right? So it, it, it is kind of um, – it, it is cool that there are a lot of places that are getting behind something like that. And it, it's, it's growing. Um, there wasn't a lot when we first opened up because a lot of it was uh, they, they had dedicated taps and they didn't have a rotating tap. It was, you know, the taps were paid for by some of the macros. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, I was going to say, um, I was watching a TV show, a reality show called Bar Rescue. I don't know if you're familiar with mm-hmm. that. But um, one of his things is, the guy that hosts the show, is that every bar he opens and turns around and all that he always finds local breweries yeah and he goes all the local breweries and he's like give me a tap give me a keg or whatever mm-hmm. he's got a section of the local beers and then he's got a section of the the standard ones yeah but he every single one he always goes to the local breweries yeah and, and makes uh, the, most sense. the reality it is, totally is makes local sense. breweries we we don't financially i can't give it give anything away i just i don't have that sort of marketing budget right right? so i can't give you a free keg i can't give you t-shirts for everybody that works there i can't fly you to germany to see the brewery you know like i like i I cannot afford that but the one thing that i can offer is and i say this to all of my my accounts i always say listen if you're ever doing an event think of me give me a call maybe we can come up with an idea do something cool and so we're able to then when you bring somebody in you don't just have some guy with a t-shirt cannon shooting t-shirts into the audience (laughs) you've got someone who can talk someone who can engage people and do something cool so we did something really cool with brew wizards spencer you know like a lot of they'll, they'll say oh come in and talk to the customers right and you know the interaction is good but you know, you need to do something a little bit cooler nowadays, right? right? Other than just showing up and being like, here's a free sample, see ya. Mm-hmm. So Brew Wizards asked us in and Spencer said, well, how, let's do something cool. How about we do uh, Trivial Pursuits Night? I'll come in, me versus anybody that wants to go against me, and if you beat me at Trivial Pursuits, just, uh, you know, question on question, um, I'll buy you a, a pint. And uh, he went and he lost miserably. It was a, it was really bad. But you know, but it was a cool interaction, right? And yeah, then we exactly. did it a second night. Both Ed and Spencer went. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it that night. I really, I really wish I had been there because I'm really good at Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> but uh, you know, the, the, but there was more people there, right? So it, yeah. it, it creates more of a following. And we're actually we did a collaboration with Brew Wizards to have them come in. We made a beer with them, and we're actually going to have them come here and bring a lot of their uh, board games to to have for mm-hmm. a, for cool. a release. So you're gonna, you're gonna put the board games in the the, the keg, 
Uh, yeah, yeah nothing but Monopoly bits coming right out in your glass. Yeah. Yeah. And, and new board game logger? Is yeah, that board game logger made with real board games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Monopoly Paleo, right? But yeah, it, but well, then that's you, the only natural thing for us then. Oh, the ultimate gravity show beer. The ultimate gravity beer. Absolutely, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, but that's a great I thing. I have is, an ingredient in mind, but I'm not going to tell, them, okay? I'm not gonna tell right. the people. All right, because the, uh, I want to flush this out. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, make yep. it happen. The the great thing is is that we can connect with a lot of people that way, right? right. And that's what this is. It's the industry is so collaborative, um, whereas the larger macros are so cutthroat, you know. And uh, we collaborate with musicians. We collaborate with local artists. Uh, we collaborate with local, you know, podcasts, yep. uh, you know, local businesses. We've done, uh, and local homebrewers as well. We've collaborated with, so uh, as well as breweries. So the cool thing is, is that we get to come in and we, and it's not just, uh, hey, how can we make more money off of this product? Because we, we're still at the point that if I do a small one-off batch, it's going to sell. I, I'm not worried about it selling. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's how can I get people in that are similar-minded, but that can approach a problem differently than I would. Uh, who can think about things differently and then that's where the ideas start to come right so right. it's it's people coming from a very creative atmosphere or a very business minded atmosphere and if we can if I can spend six to eight hours with them on a brew day collaborating with ideas that's where the real magic starts to happen in, in an industry like this. So those collaborations are, are fantastic. And to, to be able to be a part of all of that, and it also builds such camaraderie. It, as far as going to another brewery in Durham region, it, I know all of them. They all know me. And it's, it's easy to walk in. It's actually amazing. The more we, as a podcast, go around, we're finding everybody is interconnected some mm -hmm. way or somehow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So everybody we talk to has a connection to something else we've already talked to. Yeah. And the change just keeps following. And it's amazing because, uh, you know, growing up in, say, like, Oshawa, you get that stereotypical, like, oh, you're from Oshawa, and nobody mm -hmm. likes Oshawa, and there's nothing to do, and blah, 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 all this other stuff, right? And there's nothing to do but get in trouble and get <laughs> drunk and do drugs. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. as you take on something constructive and creative – and you get out there and you start realizing, man, there's actually a community out there yeah. Yeah. in Durham region yeah. that is like almost like its own bubble inside yeah. of Durham that's like mm -hmm. all interconnected. And it's a fantastic mm -hmm. supportive community that I never realized was there. Yeah. It's unreal. Like I knew there were small businesses and this and that, but I didn't know everybody worked together almost. Mm. You know what I mean? Every time we do any event anywhere in Durham, I always see this uh, very similar people because they're yeah. always doing the same events. And it's not just people working, it's people attending those events. Right. And a lot of them you see coming through five paddles, you know, like, and, and, Five Paddles or Brock Street or Old Flame or Man Antler or, you know, Second Wedge, any of the local breweries, they're, they they support that sort of thing. And it is cool because, uh, you know, everybody said when we first opened, it's like, oh, it's not going to work. Craft beer is not going to fly. You know, Oshawa is a, you know, it, they only drink, you know, macro beers and it's a it's a Bud Light, Coors Light kind of town, right? They want and their Lakeport for 24 Lake bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the Bucket Beer crowd, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and it is true, but the, it's true. Anywhere in Ontario, 97% of what's being sold in Ontario is not craft beer. It is macro beer, right? So uh, we are a small segment, but the people that are a part of this are also a part of local, uh, um, you know, the local art scene, the local music scene, the local food scene, the mm. restaurants and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. And a lot of it, some of them, you know, they do work in Toronto, but they, and they can get that in Toronto. It's easy to go to Toronto and get whatever you want. But coming out here, it's strip malls, right? Like it is strip malls and smart centers. That's uh, right. And when you get exposed to that at work and at lunch, you come out here, there is the demand for it. And it's, it's creeping out. There's that urban sprawl that is happening, but it's also happening on a more psychological level as well. And right. also the, like the palettes are changing out here. Yeah, that's and that's it. the great thing. Yeah. And I don't want to commute to Toronto if I can come in to stay in my own dirt region to do it. Oh, that. God, yeah, I Why, know. Because like, you got to pay for parking, pay for gas, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. you got to organize everybody to get out there. It's so, a pain. It is a huge pain. So Even for us to go to breweries out there, it was a pain. Yeah. And that's why we opened one here is because we did not want to have to drive into Toronto all the time. Well, I remember going to like Niagara and even doing like vineyard tours. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking like, man, I really wish there was vineyards out here. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then craft brew places started popping up and it's like oh man this is even better mm -hmm. yeah like, that's the greatest better. thing about beer you can make beer anywhere yeah, yeah. you don't need a, a field yeah <laughs> exactly. i don't have to grow the beer which is yeah. great but you do have to order in the hops I'm i do yeah, yeah yeah somebody has to grow it but uh i just get it shipped in <laughs> you have to learn about all the hops is that is that important yeah you know what i looked up 
And there's got to be over 100 different types of hops. So. There is. It gets kind of mind-boggling how many um, ingredients are out there. And uh, you can keep experimenting and experimenting uh, with with non-stop different types of hops and different, different ways to make beer. So uh, that's good because the process actually gets better. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people are, you know, you, you have people that go into that niche where they do the, a lot of the experimentation. And then you have them that's like, no, 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 I've got these three hops that I've used forever. I can't change that. Um, so the the knowledge base is getting a little bit more difficult to understand all of it. You, you have a, a chemistry understanding of how hops are utilized, uh, and then you can kind of go off of how other people use them. So, but even we're finding out over the last you know four or five years that uh, different um, timing techniques of hopping uh, makes a totally different product at the end. So even the, a traditional way of doing using the hops are just it's being thrown out the window, and everybody's like, "Oh, you're crazy! You can't do that." But the products are getting better. So there's ways that you can have hops that they're they're doing cryo hops where they freeze the hops and then they they pull out more of the oils. Uh, you're getting lup- lupulin powder where you can actually have the super concentrated uh, um, the oil glands off of the the um, the hop plants. So you're you're getting all of these different ways of of making the beer and it's bringing out different flavors of those hops as well. So even just you know it's like cooking a steak i always think of that right when you're making a steak at home there's a million ways you can make a steak right but there's also a million different cuts of steak that you can you know if you have wagyu or if you have a kobe if you have uh, black angus or if you have you know some some other type you you can barbecue it you can broil it you can put it on your george foreman grill right so there's always different ways to make it and then there's all the spicing that you can do with it as well and some guys are really good at it and there are some macros that just, you know, you can you can cut open that plastic bag from frozen on your barbecue and it still comes out, you know, completely soft and tender and perfectly, you know, ready to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there is a, it's, the, the world of brewing has changed like that, but it's such an open community. Not, like there's not a lot of people keeping secrets. And if you do have a secret, someone will find it out. It's yeah. as simple as that. There's too many people that are curious. Because I noticed that on... Uh, on the backs of the cans now, they have the the types of hops listed. Yeah, yeah, that's the great I thing. I found that, that very surprising. Yeah, I was looking on it, and one of them had like six different types of hops. Yeah, right? yeah, even in a place like Sada City, they actually post all the recipes. I mean, a recipe really? means nothing. It really means nothing. There, there are some people who believe that a recipe is very important, and you know, it needs to be held, and it's some sort of, uh, you know, it was born from their brain, and they own it. Uh, but the the reality is, is the the recipe really means nothing. And if you put it out there for anybody to make, nobody's going to make it the same. Nobody's going to be able yeah, to exactly. recreate those flavors because guess what? Their barbecue is a different heat, or their George Foreman is a different size, right. or the beef that they bought is from a different you know herd or whatever. So that's what it comes down to. You can take that recipe. You know, I can give you the recipe for Home Sweet Home. It's a very easy recipe, right? I've got ten uh, percent wheat malt, uh, two row. Uh, Gambrinus uh, honey malt, uh, um, acidulated malt from Germany, and uh, we use uh, real vanilla beans. Uh, and we use it a Chico ale yeast, right? So there's the recipe. Go forth and make it, right? Steal my recipe and make home sweet home across the world. Well, you're not going to make it the same as me. That's right. uh, you know, you're, you are going to do it very differently, and your, your brewery will actually make it taste different. So no matter what anybody tries to do with a recipe, it cannot be recreated. And so open source recipes, I, I, I'm, I'm for, you know, like if you want to come in and as a home brewer, ask me what my recipe is for our in your face. I've done it a number of times. I go back and I brew, bring out the brew book and I open it up on the front counter and I, I list, I write it out for you. I'll put it in my own handwriting because however you're going to make it, it's going to be different than the way that I make it. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that, that's the other the great thing. There are, anybody can cook a steak. Anybody can try and recreate a polenta. But you're going to do it differently than somebody else at a, at a restaurant does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. We are cutting it uh, genuinely close to your opening, yeah. so we don't want to have people pulling on lock doors. Yeah. <laughs> there's uh, just so you know, people. There's like a hundred people outside lined oh, up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the beer's going to sell out. Do you typical do you, Thursday morning? <laughs> yeah. You run into that a lot. Beer oh, sold. There's out. one. Yeah. There is people pulling on the door. James from the tap. Folks, we uh, that's we're at a time today. We want to keep going for hours and hours, yeah. but uh, yeah. we are going to give you a chance. Uh, August 12th, Five Paddles Brewing is going to be the prize package at our anniversary party. One year anniversary. Mid a year. I can't believe we made it a year. Oh, man. Awesome. Um, but for now, that is all we have for you. Yeah. And we are going to sign out from the Ultimate Gravity Show. I am Jason McGray. And I'm Scott Dewsbury. Thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you soon. <sighs> My butt's getting sore. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, James from the Top and Tanker. He, uh...
Oh, wow. Hey, Jake, sorry, man. We're just wrapping up the podcast. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. We, I've been doing this. The problem when I do a podcast is, is that it's, uh, you got to set aside four hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, guys?